Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming on this lovely Friday to Hack Fort, kicking off a wonderful weekend of events here at the Tree Fort Festival. Um, I love smooth radio introduction. Hey, now know. there's a lot of pressure on us to I, I, it's, it's okay. work on our voices. It's, it's all right. It's fun to bust out every so often, though. <laughs> Uh, so this should be a very interesting talk, talking about uh, tomorrow's workplace. Uh, this last year definitely has changed uh, the style of work for a lot of people. Um, I know I have been working remotely for quite a while and was able to pick up a job uh, working with Nike that they would not have allowed me to do remotely and I probably wouldn't have done if I couldn't do it remote, but it's worked out for me. It's been not so good for a lot of other people. Uh, but I think this should be a good... Uh, Good little talk talking about what is the future of work and uh, what's going to carry over from this uh, whole COVID situation that we've been in. So I'd like to welcome our panelists, uh, Greg Hahn and Lucy Wallace. Or Amber. Lucy sorry. Lawless. Lily, Lucy Lawless. That was the actress. <laughs> Amber Lawless. Sorry. Apologies. Uh, That's so her yeah. stage name. It's a secret. <laughs> I, I knew it. That's what I've seen you. <laughs> so anyway, I'll uh, hand it over to these guys to get it going. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. So, this here's the deal. Uh, even in creating Hackford panels in the middle of a pandemic, things get complicated. And we had uh, a group of folks who were all lined up, and one who was going to come and be an artist in residence here in Boise. She said, "I can't go there. There's the hospitals are on crisis care, and what if something happens?" And then a, a, another woman who does uh, diversity and equity inclusion at St. Luke's or St. Alphonsus. I'm sorry. She she said, "Oh." Oh, it's that day. I'm sorry. I'm so used to being able to work from wherever I want. I'm going to be home with my mom for that time, right? So this is, so we were like, okay, so we, what are we going to do? And I decided that we've all lived through this. So I've got a little plan here, and you guys are the panel uh, with me and with Amber. So uh, my background is I, I uh, used to work at Boise State for a long time. I was a reporter, a journalist before that, um, helped launch Hack Fort uh, with Jesse's brother and a few other folks. Uh, a few years ago when Boise State got really involved in Treefort, so just been really engaged uh, ever since. I now run the very small artist residency that that woman was supposed to come stay in, and now it's empty for a few weeks, uh, which actually gives us a chance to, you know, fix the blinds and stuff, which is nice. But uh, Amber runs a new co-work space in Boise called Fort Builders, in full disclosure, I actually met her because we booked a, I have a space in there because Searle's place where I work does, is a house and I don't have an office in there because somebody's usually living there so we needed a spot to be. So that's where we made this connection and I know Amber's been doing a lot of thought and work on you know, how, how she thinks the, uh, the workplace should be and how to create kind of this, this spot for folks who maybe you're just starting out or maybe working remotely. So I want to start by with some hand raising questions. And Amber, you just start talking whenever you want. That's what you do. I'll call on you if you if it makes you feel better, but um, who well, whose work life changed obviously in the pandemic, right? To a degree. Some people didn't. That's awesome. Okay. Who was forced to shift to remote? All right, who was, who was stuck doing it in live? Who couldn't go to remote? I had a feeling that the <laughs> sound guy at the hotel would be one, right? There's definitely those folks, not always in tech. Um, who, who's still working remote? And, who's, and you'd always worked remote, I get it from the, yeah, who always worked remote, I guess. Oh, great, so you guys will have some insight. So I'm going to talk, so, and raise your hand, and I'll run over with the mic, because uh, that actually is being recorded and being sent over to Boise State. Oh, yeah, and Jesse can go, too. Um, even better. He has two mics now. Uh, what, let's talk, let's do some specifics. What got harder? For those of you who had to shift, what got harder? Just in, like, one or two words. Here, hold on. Oh, yeah, you. Say that again. Too many meetings. <laughs> I was going to say uh, company culture. That was the hard one. What I missed that one. What? Oh, uh, company culture. Just like team building, that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. When I, when I was still at Boise State when we went all remote and we would have like Friday afternoon, like sit with a drink and it got super weird. And I, I like put like this Hawaiian scene on YouTube behind me and wore a captain's hat and played a ukulele and 
things went really downhill from there, if you can believe that. Um, yeah, anything else? Any other hard bits? Well, that's not so bad. What were the good parts? Good part? Good part of working remote? Um, I, um, I get to like, um, make my schedule a little bit more. Right. Freedom, right, schedule freedom. Um, this sounds really weird, but I was pregnant during That's not weird. COVID. Perfectly yeah, normal. That, that, Very that normal thing to happen. A lot. It would have been um, weird if Jesse said that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it made that process a lot easier to be home and to work remote. But I also didn't have to tell anyone until, you know, it was one of those that didn't affect my job. It didn't affect my um, having to do interviews and go into radio and TV and whatnot. I didn't have to worry about if I was going to miss those meetings. Right. And then about two weeks before we had a baby, I was like, surprise, we're having a baby. I'm taking maternity leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, it also avoided the, a lot of people trying to figure out, oh, what, you know, co-working, co-workers in the early stages of pregnancy are one of the most awkward parts of real life work. But maybe that gets better. Go. Uh, what I thought was really interesting was productivity you realize um, how much time you're actually wasting, you know, when you're at a quote unquote where you're supposed to be, you know, office. Right. So pro productivity, I thought, um, and a lot of extra free time that you discovered, so. Yeah, the free time, I mean, I definitely, who got, I mean, clearly I did not, I, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I think I would have turned into like a triathlete or something, right? Because you have nothing but time, but then you can't go to the gym or, you know, it got really weird. Uh, but the timing, yeah, you kind of own it in a different way, right? Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Let's see. Has anybody been, f who's back now? Who's gone back to a kind of a real situation? Are you, is it, is it optional or was it like it's happening? Yeah, I'm at Boise State and it's optional. Right. Um, so we decided, uh, because we're over at the U.S. Bank building, we decided to go ahead and just, you know, we're, we're far enough away from campus. Gotcha. And we social distance. So oh, are you in the Policy Institute? Or uh, no, I'm actually the Institute for Pervasive Cybersecurity. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, are you Ed? I'm Ed. I'm Greg Hahn. Yeah, we oh, talked hey, on Greg. the email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we emailed when you first got there. Yeah. Hello. Great to meet you. <laughs> it's great to see people live. I think that's one of the positives I, of like this post, you know, workforce development. Right. Like everybody's been a two-inch Zoom screen, and now to get a chance to see people live is great. Yeah, it makes it. I mean, you do get a connection. Like I, I started at Searle's place be, a, a little bit after getting to know the woman who launched it, whose mother was Searle. Searle Mitch was an artist in town, and when she died, they turned the res, her house into this artist residency. So she, uh, Becky, has been the largely the executive director off and on for the nine years and then and I met her through this other coalition and then on the onboarding and I had spent hours and hours and hours and hours with her on zoom and then about a month ago she came to town and I met her for the very first time it was really it we felt very natural but it it, it was interesting to see that was the first time I'd probably gotten to know someone that well just over the over zoom which is not a question I thought of but has made has anybody made like a new friend over Zoom that you then later that you've never seen? Who's made a friend over Zoom that you've never seen in real life? I think I have done that. <laughs> Which is pretty cool, right? What an evening, what a what a world flattening thing. Um, so you had kind of gone back. What did what's your experience? Oh, yeah, just Good, I don't have to run this way, which is still part of this problem, but I'll work on um, it. So I work for Micron as a software developer. So um, as we were winding back, before Delta, basically, they wanted us back on the campus. So I just got an email like last week, Delta's back up, you can go back to working from home. So literally yesterday I was like, oh, I guess I'm working back from home now. So it's been on and off and it's kind of, nice to get that hybrid like go back experience mm -hmm. and then be back in the home it's like well this is nice again so kind of half and half right and did you and you said microsoft or micron mike oh, okay i just misheard so does anybody work for a company that's not here yeah so you guys have been doing this but you live here do you oh so yeah so people so who lives works for a company that's not in their town where they live how's that how's that okay so you yeah so that 
that's a whole, I'm going to follow up on that because I got lots of questions about pay and location versus the job you're doing. I think that's super fascinating, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. So we're talking about some of the best part. So what I, I would call this kind of the dispersed workplace. I don't know if that's a, I just made that up this morning thinking about what I would call the kind of half hybrid, half remote space. Um, and we've talked about some of the positives. I want to go dive into the productivity piece, though. What? So you've mentioned a couple things that helped with the product. Yeah, are there other things that helped you be more productive, do you think, from your perspective of being remote? Amber, you're not jumping in here. Anytime you want, just start talking. So I'll, it, yeah. I'll share a little bit about our experience. We, um, I'm a general contractor and designer by trade, and so when everyone else was baking bread and having fun and reading books, I was still going to work every day um, with clients who had, you know, one client had leukemia, another was a physician, and so we were trying to navigate having having my employees in the house and protecting them from the client who was a physician, and then also lecturing my employees about uh, staying out of the bars on the weekend so that we could keep our client with leukemia healthy, right? So um, that was all weird. Uh, and, and in the midst, well, prior to all of that, we had bought this old dilapidated building on State Street, and we had been in a long process of renovating it to turn it into a co-work space. And uh, and then this moment came where we realized we were really stupid for contemplating creating a space where people could come together when everyone was at home. And so we just kind of powered on and figured that there would be a place for us in the world. And if all else failed, we'd move in, my husband, Michael. And, uh, and then all these unintended consequences came around. It turned out that people actually did want to be together. And we just needed to find ways for them to navigate it. And so uh, we've done that with outdoor space. We've done it with indoor space. We've done it with schedules. We've you know, created um, uh, kind of private rooms that people could go to. And so we, it, we, it's been really interesting for us. I feel like we've been on all sides of, of uh, navigating this time. Well, that's a who I say. So the complicating factor, of course, is that it wasn't just you working from home. And in fact, for those of you who always work from home, all of a sudden, if the kids are old enough, they're at home on the on the t uh, there. And if your spouse has had a job and got pushed home, when we opened up Searle's place because we couldn't do, we normally bring in artists from around the world, but when there were travel restrictions, we couldn't do that. So we sort of did these smaller seven to ten day. Uh, studio visit so folks could they didn't spend the night there but they would have access to the studio they could leave all their stuff out and they would do that for a week and they were just so thankful because they're like these are folks who were doing their painting you know in the living room when everybody was gone and all of a sudden everybody was back I mean did that did the family arrival affect people's work life <laughs> we got a couple of oh. Um, so we have a three-year-old too, um, and we always decided to live small. That was a really important part to us. And I worked, I worked from home. My husband is a creative director, so we worked at his agency. And our our now three-year-old, um, we call her the architect of chaos. Um, <laughs> we have since promoted her to the director of destruction um, because we learned that living small is amazing when you all have somewhere to go during the day but when you have to take shifts just to do your zoom calls um it's really intense so like i would spend four hours at the park in the morning with her kyle would spend four hours in the afternoon and the byproduct of covid for us was we built artist studios in our backyard um, because there had to be a place for us to physically say uh, Naomi, you're a priority when we're with you we're with you dad's at work outside he's not here Mom's at work outside, she's not here, but we didn't want to keep shuffling her outside of our space and or shuffling each other, and so we had to create a designated space. So uh, we're designers as well. We made this killer space that we're super grateful for that we've talked about for years, but COVID kind of pushed us into it because of the fam family dynamic. We had another family dynamic 
kind of uh, yeah so i'm uh, i'm a software developer and mm-hmm. i've all i've been working from home since 2012 uh no i'm sorry 2006 so oh, wow. Um, but my there was uh, an my, internet in 2006. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, there wasn't. I made it, and so you're welcome. Uh, the uh, but my partner uh, does restaurant management, and so she clearly hasn't been working until oh, about two months ago, and uh, so that was difficult for her, particularly during the uh, spring and summer of last year when you couldn't. There wasn't even like bars and restaurants right. in New York. Like everything was closed. So. She, you know, she's sitting at home all day when I'm her only entertainment, right? She's like, <laughs> come on, let's do stuff. Let's do something. And I was like, I still have to work. I still have a 40-hour-a-week commitment while everybody else, like you said, was break, baking bread. And so that was, that took some navigating. Like, for sure. Figuring out what, sort of like time management instead of space management. Yeah, I was the, I was the time leech in our family. So I quit Boise State without a plan midway through the bit right it was either a horrible covid pandemic decision that uh you know or you know just reorganizing my priorities i was it was a really intense job the boise state's an awful place but i just had the i was the head of communications marketing and crisis comms and so i was like getting calls at two in the morning all the time it was just intense so i had about four months of sort of looking for work and volunteering. And my wife, who is also, she's a marketing writer and she's worked from home since probably around 2012. And uh, she was not, this this is the biggest reason that I'm now have a desk over at, uh, at Amber's place because uh, it was, it was clearly getting to be that point where, yeah, she's, I'm a, I was a newser and we were both newspaper people, but I was, she was a night staffer. So quietly looked at the computer and did the editing and I was a day, I was a reporter at the state house and blah, blah, blah. So I love, like I thrive from that. Like I need those little bursts of uh, interaction so I can kind of revitalize myself and not fall asleep on the couch, which is at three, which is what I was doing, you know, when I was working from home. Um, even when I had super flexibility, I had public television, I would work from home in the morning and then go for a big bike ride and then go into the office. So they would see me for a few hours and then get out of there. So I would just visit, get coffee, and talk to everybody and make them think I'd been there all day. Um, and but yeah, it becomes it. You know, those family dynamic changes, right? And it changes based on what you. I mean, I let's. I mean, I'll kind of jump into this because I think it's super important. That's why I wanted Gayla, who's the. I used to work with her at Boise State, and now she's at St. Al's. But somebody who really thinks about, you know, how equity and diversity play a role in in a changing workforce, right? Um, certainly there's a job thing, right? Our friend over here, and I didn't get his name, but yeah, he had to come in here to the hotel and hope that the people who you know, were talking on the mics and holding it weren't licking them and handing them back to him this whole time, right? My uh, really close friend, she's a hairstylist. She had to, she never stopped. She never stopped touching people, right? The whole time. They stopped doing nose and ear waxes, which also affected my wife because I was coming home looking like a Ewok, but um, they, but she still continued on, right? I was just in a conference call the other day um, with a woman from Boston. Black woman, lives in a neighborhood she grew up in, in the arts, and she sort of warned us. She goes, I gotta say, I'm in this our internet in the art, this neighborhood, you know, it's one of the least served. And sure enough, her it went out like two or three times along this whole conference call. Um, which really was sort of the big eye opener, right? That there becomes this, there are these obstacles. I mean, are there, have you guys noticed, especially folks who maybe have worked uh, from home for a long time, how have that, I mean, is that something you pay attention to or we kind of worry about ourselves? Whose internet was worse at home than they thought it was when they got sent home to work? Nobody, that's pretty good, right? Um, We had to upgrade, we have a cabin in the mountains in Atlanta, Idaho, and the internet is delivered, I think it comes to a satellite, to a little box outside of town, and then they hardwire it into everybody. And uh, that got interesting for a while, but we did, they could upgrade us somehow in the middle of nowhere. They got us, and it works just fine. Um, I don't know, are there other, I'm gonna throw it again, you guys are the panelists. What are the other equity pieces that I think are worth, that you think are worth thinking about as this, transition happens. And this is a genuine question for me, because I can think of the internet piece, I can think of the house size, right? The ability to build something out back, the ability to have enough room in your house to kind of cordon off rooms. We have a two bedroom 
home in the North End, amazing house, you know, going up in value right now as I'm talking probably. Our taxes just went up another $300 in this, but it's two bedrooms, right? And a big open room downstairs. So no, it doesn't matter where we are, we can hear each other. Um, I haven't fixed the roof of the carport, so it's too leaky to go out for one of us to go out there. Uh, I don't know, and I'm a, and that's privilege. That's coming from huge amounts of privilege, right? To have that space. Um, yeah, good. I don't want to. Anytime I start talking too long, someone raise their hand, and we'll send the mic to you. Hey, uh, we, my wife and I started staggering meetings. It's sort of funny because we have a two bedroom too, so it's like, so every week it's sort of like, hey, what, what do you got? You got a ten o'clock, okay? And then, oh, I got eleven, okay, that's perfect. I don't know if anyone else does that, but sort of, uh, sort of funny workflow. Right? And yeah, if, if you can control it, it helps, right? Yeah, jump in. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about uh, internet connectivity, yeah. and I think that's an, that's an excellent point about, um, so the, uh, the resources now that used to be part of the, the centralized office have now been distributed to the workers, right? So you need space, you need electricity, you need your uh your good internet connectivity and so if like you were saying like certain neighborhoods have varying levels of that and so yeah that could very much in impact your ability to continue to work remote if the infrastructure in your neighborhood isn't uh isn't up to par and yeah i even heard that there was um in new york city there was concerns about uh, uh water and garbage because there was no longer like sewage for example is no longer coming out of the office it's coming out of everybody's homes and so you know like you're going to the bathroom more often That's in true. your home and like concerns about this uh, which those are all those really people who are comfortable pooping at the workplace <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to those who have to drive home to do it <laughs> right true. Uh, but yeah i, I used there so, uh, on camp when you work at the boise state campus you you pick out your spots right <laughs> And then in the summer, it's glorious. You go over to one of the new buildings, and it's empty, and it's clean, and it's awesome. And then the students get back, and it's, I swear to God, this is a true story. I went into my secret College of Business bathroom, and there was like a half-eaten hamburger, like resting on the, on the toilet roll. I mean, it was just like, ah, oh, you monsters. Ruin. Yeah, you are going to jump in. <laughs> I could do a whole thing about poop. Right. <laughs> my wife says now it's home. Yeah, she goes. This home was so clean, and now you're here. There's a half-eaten hamburger on the toilet roll. <laughs> I have two really random things piggybacking on that. Um, I live in Memphis, and we didn't have recycling our garbage for almost a month because uh, the labor force got COVID, and so there was just. I mean a scene that you don't even think about in common times, but so that caused a myriad of problems after oh, that God, when yeah. no one has any place to put anything. Um, but I was thinking about two ones, you know, living in a two one and uh, staggering your calls. I feel like I work at my husband's office now because I could hear every Zoom and mm -hmm. I found myself like having opinions about his coworkers <laughs> and being like, oh man, that person's not a good listener. Um, they're too busy to like answer and not let anyone finish. And then I thought, oh, wait, I don't work there. Right. It doesn't matter. Um, but now he still has opinions about my workplace as well. So I feel like we um, have more of a loving relationship and empathy towards oh. each other's professional lives. That's interesting, right? Yeah, you can both be, oh, man, that guy's a jerk. <laughs> Gives you something to talk about <laughs> instead of just having to describe it. No, you won't believe what he says. You just told me a story about some inequity in Boise that was shocking to you with the uh, and I, you know, if this is, I mean, that just really raises all sorts of questions about who could work from home or who couldn't. Very interesting. We went last week to the state of downtown Boise with the Downtown Boise Association, and uh, one of the, uh, um, Jen, who's the head of the DBA, was commending some local business owners on the steps they'd taken during the pandemic to try and alleviate the stress on families. Um, Good. They all have good in it. Go oh, just. There are too many. Not city of good. City yeah, of city good. of good. Thank you, city, city of, good. of good. I wanted to say Idaho for good, which is also great. Um, so, city of good uh, was, uh, you know, a group of restaurant owners and farmers, and uh, 
uh, local business people who had recognized the fact that there are a lot of kids in Idaho who were food insecure, particularly on the weekends because they weren't getting those school lunches. And so they uh, pulled together a bunch of money, pulled together a bunch of volunteers, and began preparing food and sending home boxes of food on the weekends. Yeah, and not just that. They were f employing restaurant workers employing who restaurant. were out, gonna be out of work. Right. The Using idea was, how do we find a way to keep these guys you know, um, moving on something, and so became kind of a, yeah, get donations and then fund some of their, you know, that pay as it continued through the darkest time. Bringing in all this produce that yeah. was... That oh, and was, the farmers were growing yeah, stuff they couldn't absolutely. sell. absolutely, they're growing, and, and, uh, and so one of the first things they realized was that there were, there were 200 families who didn't have refrigeration in order to keep their meals cold over the weekend. And so a local uh, business, Kin, which is a restaurant here, um, they donated 200 coolers to send home. And, and then the families would bring the coolers back each week and have them filled with food for the weekend. So, so yeah, I mean, this exposed all these little, these not little, huge um, inequities that we have. And, and as difficult as some of these things were on our families, you know, we had my mother who has Alzheimer's and, and we have our grandson who a, was a first grader at the time and my mom would wander half naked through my husband's Zoom screen. You know, there were all kinds of crazy <laughs> things happening. We were blessed to have running water and refrigeration and internet that was pretty reliable. And there are, you know, obviously so many stresses going on around us that we can't comprehend. Yeah, I think it's fast. Who all's like, who's involved in helping make the decisions on whether people move r remotely or not? How do you think about all this stuff? As you, how big is your group? So um, I have two different companies. Um, one, I have 25 employees, and then the other one I have 16, um, and a myriad of subcontractors. And so we did a couple of things. In one, um, in my own entertainment industry job, we made sure everyone had internet. Um, we also asked everyone what their needs are to be at home, and that doesn't mean your space is really cool, it has posters, blah, 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 blah. Like, do you need foam? to put on the walls to make it quieter? Right. Um, do you need headphones so that there's not background noise? Do you actually have a computer at home? And so we created a stipend for that. Um, but then as soon as we found out that there was an ability for people to come back, they're still remote, we, we didn't require volunteering, but we asked them, like, since we were able to create resources for you to work from home, can you identify something that someone else in the community needs? And so we I have, an, I have a venue in Memphis that's an amphitheater for placemaking. And so everyone volunteers to come help in the food desert. So we work with the food bank distributing, if they were comfortable, if they were high risk or have a family member who's high risk, we found another place for them to volunteer. But our first thing was assessing what their resources and needs were and then paying it forward after we were able to get everyone stable in that, and then picking a part of the community that they could work with oh, to create resources. Well, if, I mean, if you think of 200 people in a town that like Disney would create have can't don't have refrigeration. I mean, a town like Memphis with such a long history of you know different economic sectors and all that, it's got to be a ton of stuff. Well, that's fascinating. We, we did this tiny thing at Searle's place, which was just. And it sort of existed before I was there, but the idea that you just, instead of me buying computers for the staff that are you work computers, you know, they're gonna go, you know, you're gonna wanna replace in a couple of years, three years anyway. Somebody's getting a fax. Um, that uh, we just sort of cut a deal. I said, if you pick whatever you want, we'll pay half, it's yours. If you, if you quit within, and it's like a, I think if it's like, if you quit within three months, you've got to pay us back for the computer. If you quit within six months, half, you know, or half, if it's a year, it's yours, right? It's like a tiny little mini contract, but it changed everything. You know, then they have a little more ownership of it. Then it's not, I don't know, they can be at home on their computer. They can have their kids' photos on there and stuff and not feel weirded out. And one chose a laptop and another chose a, she chose a desktop, you know, and is comfortable working on, on the, we do have an old work iPad that we use for a lot of things, and so it's been, we have a tiny, tiny staff, but it was kind of an interesting approach, I thought. Okay. So when I walked in today and I was checking in at the desk up front, um, I told them I was a panelist, and they said, which panel? And I said, 
today's workplace. And they said, do you mean tomorrow's workplace? <laughs> and I said, oh, shit. You're already, oh, this panel's <laughs> already outdated. I prepared for the wrong panel. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I really didn't. I really didn't. But, um, you know, to kind of switch the topic to tomorrow's workplace, yeah. which is, um, I guess, we we were on this path, right? We were starting to take more Zoom calls. We were starting to do more remote work. We were starting to offer more flexibility. And what this pandemic did was it turned everything up to warp speed, right? It, like. Immediately, your 52-year-old employee who was uh, reticent to learn Zoom before immediately had to learn Zoom. You had no other choice. And so it, it sped us into the future really rapidly. Um, the part that I, uh, as a co-work space owner, I now have a second location in downtown Boise. We, uh, at full capacity, will serve probably 200 workers. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about how how best to support those workers in this new world and what it will look like. And uh, one of the other things that I think is a great opportunity is that within these spaces where people decide to kind of come together, we now have the ability to create social change at warp speed. So in our office, we have changing tables. We have free period products. We have an inclusive workspace. We are kind and lovely to one another, and that is the rule. Uh, we recycle. We, we have this opportunity to model what is wonderful and what can be wonderful about a workplace. We also have a ton of remote workers who um, are thrilled that they get to have coworkers who don't work for their company. Right, because having a coworker who is not embroiled in all the controversies and, and uh, politics that you are is kind of wonderful. Also, you get to talk about music and uh, fun things. So, um, so those are all really wonderful things. Um, but we also are, are looking toward, we already knew that millennials do not have patience or work as we have known it. We, we're, we're recognizing that, right? We Millennials and, and younger people and a few older people, have they grew up, their brains are like computers, right? They, they, they think and process at a speed unlike someone my age. And so we're seeing in higher education that it's too slow for them, right? They, want, they don't want to go to class once or twice a week to listen to an inspiring professor. They want to download the entire course and um, binge it in a weekend and it's free. They don't have to go pay the university. They can get all that content for free. So, so these curious people are operating at the speed that we um, can't imagine at my age. And so as a result, they're not, they don't want to be held to the same standards of work that we have grown up on, the 40-hour week, right? That, that idea that every job takes 40 hours, that's crazy, right? We know young people who can write an algorithm to do their 40-hour job in four hours. And, uh, and they're rejecting a lot of the structure that we've put in place around work. They don't want to go sit in a desk. They don't want to commute. They don't want to have to hang out with people who aren't like them. They want to sit at home and work, or they want to choose a different environment for themselves where they feel more supported. And they want their work to be meaningful. They're not satisfied with uh, going and, and typing on a computer and entering data that they see in isolation they want, to, they want to understand the work that they're doing. They want to see the impact that it has on the world. They want it to support their ideals. And so trying to create uh, a place where those people can feel comfortable is a really cool and meaty topic. And, and we're like one of our buildings, we have, um, we've made all the landscaping edible. So we, uh, you know, we've planted out these garden beds. We, when the city wanted us to put in you turf, just go outside we, and have a snack anytime you, can you go want. Outside. We put in edible <laughs> clover in our retention ponds. We, the 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 bushes are blueberries and raspberries and service berries. A lot that matters to people. They care about that. They that's meaningful to them. 
we have mother's rooms, right? We, a mom wants to be able to come and pump at work, right? We, we're doing all these things uh, to, try to, make, to try to service workers in a way that makes them more productive and happier. And that will happen. Originally, we thought we were creating spaces where people would come and do head down work. And what we're realizing is that they found a way to do head down work at home. They want to come to a place and be around other people and exchange ideas and feel supported. And they want to have fun things. And they want it to be pretty. That matters to them. And uh, and, and it's, it's changing the way we think. We consider ourselves being in a hospitality business. And I, sorry, I'm overtaking this conversation. No, that's but what you're here for. I was on a, I, I have a weekly clubhouse room that is co-work space owners all around the world talking about trends, and it's just fascinating. But um, apparently, just in the most recent uh, Google Calendar update, they added a third space. So now you can say, you, you can identify your home space, you can identify your workspace, and you can identify another space. And these people who are much smarter than I am, uh, said that they see that as a trend toward an acceptance that people want to work in a third space. So rather than going, rather than, than choosing the physical space you want to work in, you're choosing the head space you want to work in. So if you need, for me, if I want, have to do accounting, I go sit at Western Collective because there are no distractions and I can move from coffee to beer and, um, <laughs> And, I, and it's a little treat I give myself when I do something I don't want to do. And, and, and so the idea of, this, of Google Calendars is that five years in the future, these people were saying they anticipate that your Google Calendar will suggest a location for your meeting. So it will aggregate whatever co-work and flex spaces are available near you, and it will make a suggestion which one you will choose it, and it will book it automatically for you so that you truly can choose your headspace on your way to work. That's crazy. Weird. Does anybody Has anybody worked in a flex space or a co-work environment outside of a little bit? What, what's your experience been? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I will say that uh, what you were talking about, like head down work at home and then having a, a communal space for, um, oh, there's like the, I just watched this thing uh, by John Cleese from like the 80s, but he talks about the creative headspace versus like, um, or an, an open headspace versus a closed headspace. So it's like, you know, your nose to the grindstone versus like being open and being creative. <clears throat> and so, like you need both modes, right? And so I've noticed that working from home, you're correct. Like like your nose to the grindstone is very good, like at home by yourself. Mm -hmm. But then it's hard to do, say, like larger planning stuff. Um, like I went into the office uh, a couple of months ago, and I normally just work from home. So uh, I met a bunch of people I'd been working with for three years and never seen in person, which was really nice. And uh, that week we got a lot of really good planning done. I think I wrote like three lines of code. I didn't get any like work work, as you might call it, um, like nose down work. But we set up the you know planning for like the next six months, uh, which was really nice. There was a lot of whiteboarding in person. And, and so I, I think you're right about like having a communal space for um, uh, Creative, uh, creative planning, like with your, with uh, other coworkers, yeah. Yeah. Got one over here. You know, one of the one of the things that I that I've discovered um, recently, obviously because of our co-work spaces, um, is I mean I have a small startup company. Um, it's 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 a phone app. Um, However, it, what's interesting is just being in the presence of other people, other professionals in other industries. I literally come home every day, whether it's through a direct or indirect um, interaction, with a different way of thinking about what I'm doing. You know, and so that's that's really interesting because you could really, you know, go down the rabbit hole with 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 your business partners. You know, and you're looking at a at a problem a very specific way, and it's hard to break out of the pattern of thinking. But now all of a sudden you have a software engineer or you have a, an artist or um, 
wh whatever the industry is, and you have the, you, you hear their conversations or you have direct conversations that all of a sudden you have these epiphanies and you, you create these, these you know, you, you're, you're creating these relationships in regards to what they're doing and, how, and, and the application for what you're doing, and it really expands solutions. So I, I've really been inspired just by that dynamic and that experience through, through the co-work space. Right. Well, the siloing, you know, certainly from a university's per perspective, right? I was at Boise State, that was a huge problem, right? You have everybody living in their own spaces and hardly interacting with each other. Boise State built a, it's called the ERB, the Environmental Research Building, over on the Broadway side of campus. And the idea was they were going to take, you know, civil engineering, but also, don't go, I'm going to make you talk about photography and the <laughs> new economy. Yeah, you better run. No. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, well, yeah, Matthew just got a space. Uh, talking about people who couldn't just disappear during the pandemic, you had to be within a 200, an 800 millimeter space of other people uh, so you could capture them. So I do want to hear about that. But I'll tell you, so this, so Boise State, trying to, trying to combat it, we'll take civil engineering, we'll take the researchers from geosciences, hydrologists, but also political science folks who are doing the policy. So both the science and the policy around environmental issues question then becomes, so they made, and they just ran, they, they kind of forced everyone to mix it up. And it was almost like a random draw where your office was gonna be and all that, and they hated it. And quietly shuffled around trading offices and stuff until they were all back in their little silos. Uh, so you, there's some things you can't force, but we were, I remember this, as there was a study out of a hospital that talked to, to physicians and followed their you know, how they were thinking about their, you know, their approaches to problems that were coming up. And by moving, by creating like a, both a dining space where they would have to interact and not just like the, like the, you know, the oncologist, eat with the oncologist and a bathroom space. So you go, it's where you go to the bathroom and where you eat. And they forced this mixture by the way they kind of designed it. And they said they could see a, 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 a documentable change in how they approach their patients because they were getting these broader insight. I mean, it really is true, but it kind of, I want it, so you, because Matthew has an actual job and has to run around and take other pictures. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just, oh, you're right behind him. Tell us a little bit about what we're talking about, and it's a, the panel of audience, is what this new world has been. And a lot of folks have been able to kind of work remotely. There's been, not too many people had to kind of keep showing up, but you had to keep showing up. Yeah. What's, yeah. Did the did it change? What was it horrible? Did you learn new things? Boy, thank you, <laughs> um, Matthew Wardell. Everybody, hello. <laughs> you know it's interesting. <clears throat> um, I have been a freelance photographer for years, and um, in February of last year, we decided my good friend and coworker here at Treefort, Aaron Rodriguez, and I decided to start a photography studio up on the bench, and. Uh, he came from a lead photographer position at Sensi with a pretty robust background in commercial photography, and I come from this kind of stuff, event photography. Um, and so, you know, prior to that, I was working from home. Um, my office was a room in my apartment, and I worked on a laptop. And when we got the studio in February, and then COVID kicked off, it was almost like, our world transitioned from being at home. I mean, he was he was at a full time job, but you know, we were in the studio every single day. So while everyone else was working from home. We were, yeah. I mean, we were showing up, doing the work. Um, most of it was just like, like I said, in the studio. We didn't do much on location stuff throughout COVID um, for obvious reasons. But um, yeah, we were up on the bench in the Gem Center for the Arts, which was a great place to kick things off, a little 800 square foot flex. I mean, it really was just a big open room. We could redesign it every day however we wanted it. Everything was on wheels. We just, it was a super modular space, which worked really well. Yeah, and there were other people there, other artists and other folks you could engage with, right? Yeah, you know, totally, right? yeah. I mean, the, it's a four-story building, you know, full of artists and creatives, and, um, you know, you'd have your own kind of walled off. They're f false walls, but, you know, you'd have your own space that you're renting. Um, and then in May of this year, we moved uh, right across the street from Searle's Place um, and Western Collective. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
and got a 1600 square foot studio space. But the same kind of philosophy applies for us. It's like everything's modular on wheels. You know, we can move stuff around and change the spaces we need depending on the project or the time that we're working, how many people are on a team, if we're hiring. Uh, we just added someone to our team, which is super exciting. Um, and so it's like having to be able to just adapt really quickly. Um, we're small, we're just a three person team, so it's pretty easy, but yeah, I don't know if that. But building the space your... intentionally for flexibility, I think, is important. That's part of what this whole idea is, right? Sure. Like, I've always, you know, to get back to the Boise State thing, we, one of the other big issues, the pressures on campus is space. Everybody wants an office, or traditionally everybody would want an office. I had a gorgeous one. It was a corner on the new alumni building right on Broadway. It looked out over the foothills, and I was never there. Like this, I would. I had my laptop, and I would work. I would work at the sub. I'd work at the ILC. You know, just wherever I could. Outside, you know, the Wi-Fi is so good on campus. You know, you kind of anywhere you go. Um, and so they launched a study um, to really see what what do people really need. Like, I, I mean, campus should just have a few giant flex spaces, right, where people can kind of pop in and work and connect with each other outside of their spots, but. It's nice to go into something. I mean, in photography, it sort of probably was, you know, you'd want that space anyway, even if it was the 50s. But it's like just that attitude, I think, is kind of caught on with everybody else in terms of space. But Totally. Yeah, I mean, it's a little different with the photography studio because you need a yeah. modular space. But even when we have clients come in, you know, teams of six, seven, ten people come in, you know, we have tables and things that can kind of, the whole space can shift to accommodate. We had the tree fort volunteer team meet there, which was like, you know, 25 people and the whole space can just, you know, grow and expand, contract, whatever it needs to be. And it, it just feels great being able to do that seamlessly. Right. Well, we, yeah, I've met over there with you guys with yeah. four or five people and it's very intimate. Yeah. And then you can like, like you say, blow it up. It's not 400 chairs, no matter how many people you have in yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. down alongside <laughs> that you can't move. They're stuck. <laughs> I know we're out of time, right? A couple minutes. Okay, so um, one other thing, kind of along that, along the trend, and kind of what I'm seeing in the world. There are, uh, I mean, an example. We live in one of those new buildings downtown that's uh, residential, uh, like a residential tower, and the entire lobby is little rooms you can dip into. Right? Some of them have desks, some of them have lounge chairs, and uh, I. The trend in other cities that's slowly coming here is that there will be more and more and more opportunities for flexible work. There will be more spaces like that. There will be, there are uh, COVID taught hotels that they needed to um, probably broaden their appeal. And there are um, industrious, I believe it's industrious, is um, now putting co work spaces in some hotels. Uh, there, I anticipate that there will be a lot of changes in the buildings. There will not, you know, we have all these tall buildings in downtown Boise. If you are an owner of a small business, the idea of going in and renting uh, or leasing, having a seven year lease on an entire floor of a building, there are a lot of companies that are gonna second guess those decisions now. And so, uh, I really think that that will be a trend. You will see these little flex offices, flex spaces pop up in all kinds of buildings. They'll be in hotels, they'll be in office buildings, they'll be in malls. They'll be, uh, will continue the trend toward mixed use that we have seen, but work will be integrated into those mixed use developments even in the suburbs, in rural areas. You can just rent one of those like sunglasses kiosks at the mall to just to be your office. <laughs> if you're really social. Yeah, jump in. <laughs> so I have a question now that everyone works remotely. Um, do you have specific, do you work remotely at your cabin and do you have specific rules on like what you shouldn't do there no, and that's, let's just, we're not going to solve the workplace of tomorrow, but let's at least individually help each other have a better work-life balance. No, I'm terrible at it. I'm terrible at it. And I, a part of me loves to work up there because it's, I can sit and look at the mountain while I'm doing it, and that's very pleasant. 
Um, part of me is really mad that I have internet at all. I grew up in a, my family had a cabin in northern Minnesota, and when we went there, there was no, there was no electricity. We had running water pumped out of the lake and gas, everything, and no electricity, and now there's a phone, and there's Wi-Fi, and there's, and if you keep, if you bring your can, you know, this is always my most waterproof camera, right? So I got it out in the canoe, and as you're ca canoeing back, you pull up to the dock, and it starts buzzing because it catches the Wi-Fi, and it just absolutely ruins the entire thing. <laughs> so, I, no, I don't know. I've been, kids have asked me that over the years at Boise State, what's your work-life balance in this, with the phone? Um, when I worked at the Statesman, I, I pushed off a phone for a long time. They made me get a pager. This is in like the early 2000s, because they were sick of they would. This is true. They would have to call me at Guernica, the basketball bar over here, and they were like, "Is Greg there?" And they're like, "Yeah." And then they make me come around behind the bar, and I'd be like, "Yeah, okay." I didn't answer the store questions on the stories, um, but at least I, I felt good. You can call me once at the bar, and I feel pretty good. But no, I don't. What are you? How do you do that? How does everybody? How does? You're lucky that Matthew was just here and I made him talk about your business oh, because, yeah. yeah. We're like <laughs> Matthew's partner here, and the, the, we just, we, they all they know all about you now because he was talking about. Yeah, it was interesting. Like a year and a half ago, when uh, you know all of my friends started working from home, and they're like, "This is impossible," and I and. Uh, or like, this is great, and then a month later, they're like, this is impossible. And it's like, oh, this is all the stuff I went through in 2006 when I started doing this. And uh, what I found is because like you need to have some sort of separation of work and life, right? right? You need to, and so if you can't do it physically, then you need to do it temporally, right? You need to be like, this time is work time. And so there's stuff like, there's just things you don't do during work time, right? You don't play video games, you don't have a beer, you don't do X, Y, and Z until, work day is over. And so um, I think that's really helped me is like, and when those, when those barriers start to break down, then that's when stuff gets real messy. And so uh, that, that's one of the best things I've found. It blurs your day. Do you pick up your phone and check your email from bed? Because I do that. Who else does that? <laughs> Don't do it, right? Don't stop doing it. Do what I say, not what I do. I don't, yeah, we done? We out of time? Well, guys, this has been great. Thank you. I, this is more fun than listening to a bunch of people who claim to know what they're doing. I appreciate you guys taking this and sticking around and sharing your insights, certainly with me. Uh, Let's give a round of applause do this for more uh, often Amber for and you Greg guys, here. For you guys. And thank Modern you, Amber. Thing. Thank you. Now she's got to drive to catch him real quick and back all in one day. So thanks, guys. And thanks, Jesse, for running around no with the problem. mics.